Hi, welcome back to our Road to Steam series. It's been a while, but we're back from the holidays with some tasty new hoos for you. In today's episode, we'll finish up our combat foundation that we began in our last dev diary and set up a play area where we will test the behaviors of newly created enemies and mechanics. So without further ado, let's dive right into it. Our first order of business will be to revisit what we did in our last episode to make some minor adjustments. During our holiday break, we tested our prototype for lengthy periods of time and found that the decision to place enemies' health display beside the hilt was not an ideal choice. It forced the player to divert too much of his attention away from the fight if he wanted information on his target's current health, and in a game where observation and making decision quickly is crucial, we couldn't keep it that way. The new solution we found was to display the information much closer to the enemy, so that the player can focus its attention on both the target and its health at the same time. To accomplish this, we chose to relocate it on the blue bar, as it would constantly follow the targeted enemy while being right under it. By making some small adjustments to the hilt's visual design, we are now able to see the enemy's health clearly when playing. The second problem we found was the game's difficulty wasn't flexible enough. In Hoos, we plan to adjust the difficulty throughout the game in three different ways. The first is with enemy types. By combining different enemy types, we can modulate the difficulty by creating diverse scenarios to challenge you. Our second way is with the amount of enemies on the screen. The more enemies there are, the harder it gets. Our final one is the global speed of our enemies, the main catalyst of our problem. It acts as an umbrella that encapsulates the other two. To put it simply, it's like a master volume on a sound system. When you're adjusting its value, it drastically changes the difficulty, as the other two ways we modulate are directly linked to it. The problem we have with this is that we arrive at the peak difficulty too rapidly when changing the enemy's speed, impeding our ability to gradually increase the challenge throughout the entire game. The thing we need to do is reduce the enemy's speed influence on the difficulty, so that its peak can be reached much later. To accomplish this, the solution we found is to use slow motion during gameplay. Implementing it is not too complicated, as we just need to decrease the timescale value of the engine to slow down the game to the amount we want. You can see by doing this that it doesn't matter how fast enemies are, we can just slow down the game to counter the speed. However, if you closely observe the enemy movements in slow motion, you can see that it is very choppy. This happens because our collision movements are done with physics. With the Unity engine, when we use physics in our code, it updates itself with the physics schedule. The physics schedule updates code 50 times per second. So when we slow down time by 90% for example, the update rate changes from 50 to 5. That's why enemy movement looks choppy, as they move 5 times in the span of a second instead of 50. To remedy this problem, the physics update rate must remain constant at 50 steps whatever the slow motion amount. To do this, we need to multiply our physics update rate by our current slow motion value. This will completely negate the effect of slow motion on the physics schedule, which will allow us to keep it constant through time. By doing this, we now have smooth movement when slow motion kicks in. With that done, let's take a break from the serious math business. Our friendly cubes of the abyss are in need of our help. We need to puff them jibbies and make them shine. It's time for some bourgeois makeover. Cue the music. With our models redone, and slow motion implemented, it's now time to create a system that will dynamically integrate the slow motion into gameplay. We need to keep in mind that we cannot abuse slow motion too much, as it would completely remove the fast aspect of our combat. It needs to be present enough to reduce the difficulty curve without slowing the pace of the game. To resolve this problem, we found a two-step solution. Firstly, the slow motion effect will only activate when hitting an enemy. 
to keep the fast pace of combat, slow motion will fade away after a small amount of time, just enough so that the player can plan his next attack. Secondly, we scan how many enemies are in the cross guard when the player lands a hit. The more enemies there are, the stronger the slow motion value. So when few enemies are around you, the slow motion effect becomes almost unnoticeable. With this system, we can now boost the enemy speed up to 15, when previously we struggled to survive an enemy speed of 5. In our previous episode, we briefly mentioned what would happen when the player would miss an attack. We did not implement it at the time as it wasn't a priority. But now that our combat foundation is nearly finished, we need to implement these disadvantageous states to complete our combat loop. So let's start with a small refresher on the concept. In Hoos, we want you to feel skillful when you engage in combat. So things like madly mashing the attack button to brute force your way through challenges are behaviors we want to punish. We want you to earn your victories by being deliberate and precise in your actions, as it is a lot more gratifying. The way we found to punish these patterns is by making the player miss attacks. This is how it works. When there are no targets in the cross guard, the player will miss if he attacks and enter a vulnerable state for a small period of time. During this state, the player cannot do anything and is completely open to enemy attacks. To show that you're currently in this state, we firstly need to create an indicator. For the moment, we'll simply create a placeholder UI with simple images that we previously imported from Inkscape. The placeholder item will be placed above the player character and show the current cooldown of the state. Now, by checking if there are no targets in the cross guard when the player attacks, we can trigger the vulnerable state, its timer, and disable the player inputs for the duration. With our first disadvantageous state done, it's time to implement what happens when the player gets hit. In Hoos, we want you to feel like an unstoppable warrior even when you're getting your ass handed to you. To achieve this feeling, we took inspirations from other games. In these games, when the main character gets hit, there's a certain cinematic flair that's added to the mix to give the action more humph. The main character gets trashed around during the exchange, but you can still see some personality through his actions when he recovers from attacks. We like this approach as it makes you more immersed in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, treating your mistakes as part of the experience, rather than something that makes you feel dumb. To implement this, we'll need to make some small changes to the hilt. First and foremost, let's modify our UI so that it displays our current health in our hilt center. Let's also transform our red circle into a proper health bar that can be emptied when we take damage. Now that we have set up our visual feedback, we'll make our health points drop by one unit every time an enemy makes physical contact with us. Everything seems to work as it should, except for the fact that our enemies are a little too trigger happy at the moment. This can be fixed by adding a cooldown on enemy attacks. It will stop their movement, and they won't be able to attack again until the cooldown has worn off. With that done, it's time to add our cinematic flair. Here's our idea. The player will need to get pushed back when hit, to create some distance with the attacker. While being pushed, he will be immune to attacks and push other enemies that are in his way. At the end of the push, he will stop his momentum by stomping the ground, knocking back surrounding enemies to give himself enough breathing room to re-engage into the fight. To implement this, we will first tackle the player being pushed. Like we did with our enemies in our previous episode, we will add a hit-stun state to the player, which will be triggered every time he gets hit by an enemy attack. During this state, the player will be pushed back, and the duration of the push will be shown on our placeholder indicator. Adding to this, let's create a collision box around the player when he's being pushed to prevent enemies from getting through him. With that done, we will add another collision box around the player the moment he stops. By doing this, it will push all the surrounding enemies, and bring our ground stomp to life. Our final disadvantageous state that we will implement is the one regarding the shield. The idea is that when the player hits an enemy's shield, he'll get stunned during a certain amount of time, making him vulnerable to enemy attacks. The way to implement this is quite similar to what we did when the player misses an attack. We trigger the player's hit-stun state when he hits a shield, disabling his inputs. 
The enemy gets pushed a little to give a sense of impact, and we display the cool down timer of the stun on our placeholder indicator. Now that our combat foundation is finally complete, it's time to set up our testing grounds. The initial version of our testing grounds will consist of two spawners. One that will spawn enemies on the left, and one that will spawn enemies on the right. They are in no way a representation of how spawning will work in the final game. Their purpose is to offer a quick way to test enemies and new mechanics on the battlefield. The way they function is as follows. Each spawner houses a list of enemies that it can spawn. A time value is randomly chosen in a certain range. This value represents the spawn rate of the spawner. Each time an enemy is spawned, a new time value an enemy is chosen. The position where the enemy is spawned will always be relative to the screen's borders. As for example, if the left spawner spawns an enemy, the enemy's vertical position will be the same as the player, however its horizontal position will be a chosen distance relative to the screen's left border. If the spawner was on the right, it would be the same thing except for the little difference that the enemy's horizontal position would now be relative to the screen's right border. Finally, each spawned enemy registers itself in one of two lists. One list for enemies on the player's left, and one list for enemies on the player's right. Each spawner will check their respective list every time they need to spawn an enemy. If too many enemies are currently registered in a certain list, the corresponding spawner will skip its spawning order. With that done, our testing grounds are now officially open for bloodshed. Complete. That's it for us today. Stay tuned for our fourth episode of our Road to Steam series, where we will cover the progress we'll make on the game in the coming weeks. If you have any feedback or just anything you want to share, don't be shy, and fill the comment section down below. If you enjoyed our content and want to support the channel, feel free to leave a like and subscribe. On this, Godspeed to all of you, and we'll see you on the next episode of our Road to Steam series.